Hi, good morning, everyone. Are you well? Yes. Are you sure? <laughs> uh, well, it's Saturday morning. Um, we partied a little bit last night. I hope you had a nice Friday evening and you are uh, fresh and ready after a great start. It's really difficult uh, to talk after the mayor, but I'm doing my best. Uh, it's very classy and nice uh, city, Durham, and this venue itself and the stage. Very flashy. I usually focus on the substance and content of my lectures, but today I'm going to go all out on the style and flashiness. I even have those patterns up there on my PowerPoint. There we go. Um, and I'm going to use all the techniques I've learned through years for public speaking. I'm going to go over some of them as we continue. They say you should start with a question. Let's start with a question. Raise your hand if you have a car. Keep your hands up if you have given a name to your car. <laughs> Keep your hands up if the name is a human name, like Alice and Bob and Taha and Herb and Kim. Keep your hands up if you think of your car as a person with a gender, like a she or he or they. Quite a few of you, quite a few of you. And when I was looking around to find some information about this, uh, I found this report from the UK government. They have a lot of free time in their hand. <laughs> uh, the, the report is released in 2018, 2018 when they were preparing for Brexit. Uh, they asked people around, over a quarter of UK motorists named their car uh, according to a new research. So that's very interesting because we are not alone. A quarter of people think and of the cars maybe as a person or half person, they give their car the name. Uh, this is called anthropomorphism, and I practice a lot to pronounce this word. This is our tendency to assign and to assume human-like qualities and features for objects, for sometimes even living objects, like animals, living objects. Uh, animals and objects are cars, our phones, etc., etc. Uh, the report also released a list of most frequent names that people have used. Uh, some of these names are generic and genderless, let's say Bumble, and some of them not only have a gender, but also strong identity. Some of them are very strong uh, <laughs> identity. But, uh, so I'm going to talk about gender today a little bit. And when I told my partner I'm going to talk about gender, she said, darling, you have big balls. <laughs> I said, thank you very much, darling. We, we were having sex. I thought it's a compliment. He said, no, idiot. I mean, you are brave. Then I said, sorry, that's toxic masculinity, because women could be brave as well. Uh, Kim, she wasn't there, but, you know, as an example. <laughs> sorry, Mayor. Um, uh, and she said, no, idiot, because I know you're going to make jokes, and these days you cannot make jokes about gender. You are not Jimmy Carr. You can't get away with all those sexist jokes. Uh, and I said, yeah, I know I'm not Jimmy Carr. I don't have his privileges and immunities. If I don't pay my taxes, I'm going to be deported next day. <laughs> also, he's usually talking to a drunk audience at 10.30 p.m. in London. I get to talk to a drunk audience at 10.30 <laughs> in the morning in Durham. <laughs> Obviously, I'm assuming you're drunk. Hopefully not. I'm also imagining you're naked. <laughs> this is one of my techniques to boost my confidence. Uh, I asked ChatGPT for advice when I was preparing for this talk, and uh, it said that I have to be very flashy, as you see. Oh, sorry, it says avoid being too flashy, uh, because Durham is all about substance and, uh, you know, knowledge. Um, okay, I had the information, I just didn't use it properly. <laughs> uh, I did ask if it's helpful if I assume my audience is drunk and imagine them naked. It said no, actually. It said, instead, try to use deep breathing <laughs> and make eye contact. The good thing is that making eye contact is very much similar to imagining the audience naked. You wouldn't <laughs> be able to tell the difference. But speaking of ChatGPT, I assume all of us know what it is, more or less. We perhaps don't know how exactly it works. No one knows. But uh, I don't need to introduce uh, generative AI and, um, you know, products like ChatGPT. But I have a question for you. How many of you, when you are interacting with ChatGPT, feel or treat it as a human, like you say please and thank you? How many of you think of ChatGPT as a person with a gender? 
quite a few of us, quite a few of us. And there is proper research, this time by actual researchers. Uh, about three quarters of people think of ChatGPT with, with an entity with human-like features like gender. And out of those three quarters, around 70% of them think of ChatGPT as a man, which is quite surprising because almost all the other AI interfaces we interact with, like Siri, like uh, our navigation system, or Alexa, they have features like women. Uh, so this must be an exception. By the way, throughout the talk, I'm talking about men and women, male and female. Of course, there are other gender identities available, but um, it's just because I have very little time. And some of the results I'm going to show you are about all different gender identities. Uh, you can ask me later if you're curious about the results about other genders than uh, male or female. So the question I had in my research was how this anthropomorphism how this gender assignment, among other things that we do when we interact with machine, with AI, how it affects our behavior when we are interacting with them, let's say, in a team setting, when we have to cooperate with them, when we have to trust them. We ran a series of experiments. Uh, we used a particular game that is called Prisoner's Dilemma. It's a very simple game. It's a traditional way of measuring cooperation and trust among humans, primarily. Uh, I tell you quickly how the game works. We have two players, and each of them can make two, only two decisions. They have two options. In this case, they can either go team, which is shown by that uh, blue square. Um, and if your partner, if the other person also decides to go team, they are both rewarded. They collect 70 points. They could also go solo, and if both decide to go solo, they only get 30 points each. So it is, of course, a good strategy to go team. However, if you decide to go team, but your partner defects and decides to go solo, they collect 100, and you go home empty-handed. So if they choose to free ride, they are better off, but collectively, it's not good for the team. So this is a classic experiment people have been using for several years. What we added to this, we also asked people when they were making those decisions, what they think the partner is going to do. Particularly when they decide to defect, we ask them, do you think your partner is going to defect too? And if they said yes, we assume there is a distrust. So I know my partner is going to defect, I'm going to defect too, I'm not going to trust them. Or sometimes people believe their partner is going to cooperate because it's a nice person, yet they decide to defect. And that is what we call exploitation deciding to defect while you believe that your partner is cooperative, okay? So that's the setting, and then we got people, well, it's an online experiment. We collected people uh, and invited them to an online interface. They had to play this game with partners that were assigned to them randomly, and the partners could be human or AI. A little secret between us, we didn't have either, neither human nor AI behind the scene. We made some random decisions, well, we told participants that these decisions are coming from uh, AI or human with different identities. Then we measure the level of cooperation, and we see that people, participants, are generally slightly more cooperative when they, are, they believe they are interacting and playing with a human. They are slightly less cooperative when they play with AI. So that's not a huge difference. But then when we looked at the reason for defection, when they defected, why they did that? because they thought the partner is going to defect, or they think they thought the partner is going to cooperate, but they wanted to exploit, we see a big difference. We see that when people defect against other humans, because, mostly because they don't trust them, they think they're going to defect too. Whereas when they defect against AI, to a greater extent, it's because of exploitation. They don't feel as guilty to exploit the machine. Kind of makes sense. Then we added gender. And we see that people are uh, generally more cooperative because when they play against female players. And that applies to all sorts of participants we had with their own gender identity. Uh, this could be because they trust female more and they think they're going to cooperate as well. Or it could be because they feel all right to exploit female partners. And we could look into that and we see that, in fact, people, when they defect against male partners, it's primarily because of lack of trust. Whereas when they defect against female partners, to a big extent, is due to exploitation. So they feel it's okay to exploit the partner, whereas they don't have that feeling when they're playing against male. 
partners. This is what we see in this diagram. Then we combine the two. Now we have human, AI, female, and male. And we see that, okay, the pattern is more or less the same between AI partners and human partners. There is a slightly uh, more cooperation when they play against human, as we saw earlier. But then when we look into the reason of defection, reasons behind defection, we see a very different pattern. We see that the main reason for defection against other males, against human males, is because of distrust. And the main reason uh, to defect against female AI is exploitation. This is funny because you can see uh, participants trust male AI more than human male. Well done, guys. <laughs> but we become really exploitative. The red bar to the right, we show the highest level of exploitation when our partner is a female AI, like Siri and Alexa, et cetera, et cetera. This might not be an accident that most of AI interfaces we interact with have female identity because we feel all right to exploit them, and uh, we might pay for them, and we might buy for them more easily, et cetera, et cetera. Now the question is that how things would be different if we have an AI manager. Imagine we have a team of people, three of them, working together to solve a problem, and then they have an AI or a human manager who watches them and eventually decides to promote one of them or to give a reward to one of them and to punish the others. We wanted to see how the identity or features of this manager affects people. This is exactly what we did. We had another online experiment where people had to solve a puzzle together. And before the experiment, before they got involved, we asked them how they assess the fairness of different types of manager. Uh, they had to score managers, male, female, man, human, AI, and more or less, they had a high level of trust and high perception of fairness, let's say around 7 out of 10. In fact, they had the highest perception of fairness uh, with female managers, slightly more than 7. But not much of difference. And then they did that game, and then we selected one of them randomly. Again, we didn't have the manager watching them. We just randomly selected one and gave them some cash. And then we asked them, how do you feel about your manager now? And they were given different types of manager. So those who were awarded and had a male AI manager were extremely happy. This is the change in the perception of fairness among those who were awarded. And we see that they love their male AI manager because you know, they made the right decision. The same decision in the exact same situation coming from a female human manager had the smallest amount of increase in the perception of fairness. So they're already the least grateful to the manager who made the right decision. And then we looked at those who were not rewarded, the ones who were punished by the manager. Of course, they would be outraged, but we wanted to see which group receives or shows the highest amount of outrage. The same decision of not being rewarded coming from a female AI manager created the biggest amount of dissatisfaction. In fact, people were more or less OK with their male human manager who did not select them. Their assessment of the fairness of the manager did not change much. But the same decision coming from a female manager uh, made them really unhappy about the manager, particularly a female AI manager. So this is a very sad moment in the lecture. Let's change the mood by showing you some funny images. <laughs> this is an artist's depiction of the future back in 1930s. This is quite accurate, you know? We have phones like this these days, but luckily the design is a little bit different, and I'm very happy for that difference. But uh, some of these photos show that how in the past people had very accurate and bright ideas about the future, but we find these photos funny, these images funny, because they were in the framework of the past. You know, we are able to cross water today, but not with, uh, you know, horse-drawn um, coaches and balloon-drawn horses. We have airplanes, et cetera, et cetera. Or we, read, we do read the news on our TVs or on our phones, but it's not just an image of a newspaper. My favorite is this one, Japanese vision of the future classroom. It's a very fancy classroom. Everyone has some sort of computer. The teacher perhaps is teaching from home uh, over Zoom, like pandemic time. <laughs> what I like about this image, it's so nice and futuristic, but also there are Robots going around the classroom and smack naughty children. 
So that part of culture remains even in the projection of the future. Uh, this is the most accurate one. It's how people thought we're going to dress in the future, back in 1914. And if you're on Instagram, this is, this is pretty accurate. <laughs> So the point that I'm trying to make is that not only in the past, at any given time, the image we have of the future technologies could be biased, but also sometimes when do, we do have the technology, like when we had the internet and we had the web, for 10 years we published books like this, very hefty lar large internet yellow pages with all the names and addresses of different web pages. I think younger audience don't even know what yellow pages are, those are things we don't need because we have the bloody internet. But people printed the yellow pages of the internet because they couldn't think of the new technology in a different mindset. They translated the old-fashioned yellow page thinking into the digital technology. So now we are facing all these new changes in our societies because and related to the AI and artificial intelligence technologies. I think my main message and my main sort of plea is Let's not be stupid. Uh, because throughout the history, we usually, when we are dealing with new technologies, uh, we, it takes us some time to get rid of the issues and problems we had in the past. For example, prejudice, sexism, racism. These are things that exist in our societies, and my worry is that the new technology might amplify them. You might think that, oh, it's okay to be sexist against machine, against AI, who cares? But my worry is that, it becomes a habit. If I feel comfortable exploiting my female AI assistant, I might, this might affect the, the way I behave with my female colleagues, or with my female managers, or my female mayors. So it is important to remember that new technologies do not need to be confined to the old framework of thinking. We should avoid repeating the same mistakes that we have been making over the course of history, and again, I'm worried we might even make bigger mistakes now because we have the tools. Uh, there is significant scrutiny at the moment on AI products, and I think that's great. We want AI products to be human-centric, to be fair, and to be explainable. But also, it's very important to make sure that humans are human-centric, fair, and explainable. Because if we don't resolve those issues among ourselves, no matter how good our AIs are, we will still be suffering. Thank you very much. Just a quick question. Uh, I'm, uh, so thank you for the presentation. It was terrific. Um, but you, you know these these differences that you find uh, with regard to how um, you know uh, the comparing human uh, men and female uh, to AI versions. I mean, I guess I you know I mean even leaving aside the AI stuff. What is there any sense? I mean, I realize you know you didn't have the time to go into it, but why why do why why are those Reactions so different. Is there any anything that you can just tell us about why why a female manager delivering bad news is that seen is three times worse than than a, than a male person, which is almost virtually no negative reaction? Well, it's a very important and very difficult question. Of course, there are different reasons behind the prejudice and uh, expectations we have. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we might uh, generalize our individual experiences differently as we see. I might be sacked by a manager. That's, uh, you know, that's not a very pleasant experience. But if I sack by a female manager, I take it much, you know, it outrages me even more. This could be related to other experiences I had in life that I remember selectively. Uh, this goes back into the cognitive biases we have. And then there is the cultural element. Mm -hmm. You know, the way that genders have been depicted in the in the media. You know, I made a few jokes about making jokes about gender, and they were not jokes. I wanted to make a point. I'm all for comedy, as you can guess. <laughs> but if we repeatedly make jokes about a certain group of society, yeah. we know it's joke, but it might, you know, affect sure. the culture. And again, you don't need to go much uh, more back in the history. I'm at Trinity College Dublin now. And there was a period of time, as a, as a female student, you would not be able to get a PhD degree from Oxford and Cambridge. You could get it from Trinity College Dublin, so a lot of female students came to Dublin just to get their degree. Yeah. They were referred to as steamboat ladies, and they had to pay. Uh, 
And you think about it and think, wow, that's so ancient. And then it's like 100 years ago. Mm. So this history of prejudice uh, and discrimination that we are carrying with ourselves still affect our behavior today. today yeah. And my whole point is that we should be able to fix them before we go to the next stage when we have AI and other entities in our societies that we interact with in a human way. Okay. Uh, are you hopeful about it? Because it seems, in, I mean, I guess arguably Uber is already in a sense, an AI that is managing people. Uh, and are you hopeful about a future where increasingly our coworkers and our managers are, are artificial? I, I am a pro-technology person yeah. uh, in general, and I like uh, to think that we will figure it out. It might take a while. Uh, the example, my go-to example is electricity. Today, we all like, like, no one says, oh, I hate this electricity thing. But people used to hate electricity. And it took 50 years in the US market to regulate electricity. And for 50 years, people got killed. Uh, houses were burned down because we were excited about the technology, but we didn't know how exactly to use it. Yeah. There were no regulations whatsoever. It, I hope it doesn't take 50 years for us to regulate AI. The EU has started to... Oh, is that okay to talk about EU in this country? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, they, they released the AI Act earlier this year. Um, it was very sort of laid back uh, type of regulation, I would say. But that's the beginning, and that's a good start. Yeah. I hope uh, policymakers and regulators catch up faster. And, uh, you know, we are excited about the technology. I use ChatGPT all the time, but I like to be able to use it safely. And then when it comes to the societal behavior, ourselves, our normal citizens, uh, you know, it's, it's about time to move on from, you know, gender stereotypes. It's about time to move on from our sexist traits or racist traits and so on and so forth. Again, because if we don't fix these problems before going to the next step, next stage, they might get amplified. Yeah. Okay. Taha, thank you so much. Thank you Great so to much. See you again. Thank you very much. Thank you.